Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, very warm welcome uh, to the posterior cortical atrophy or PCA uh, webinar for Red Image Support. Uh, we're just letting people join the meeting. And then Nikki Zimmerman and myself will be starting us off for today. So thank you so much for coming along. Uh, for those of you I've not met before or not had the pleasure of getting together with yet, um, my name is Seb Crutch and I'm one of the psychologists um, at, at the Rare Dementia Support. Um, and I'll let uh, my wonderful colleague and friend Nikki Zimmerman introduce herself. Morning, everybody. Um, if I've not met you before, warm welcome today. Um, I hope you enjoy the webinar. I hope you get lots from it. I'm Nikki Zimmerman. I'm the direct support team lead. Uh, so we look after all our members with my wonderful team. So if you've got any questions at any point, please do get in contact with us. Um, and I hope you enjoy the, the webinar today. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so particularly grateful to you, for you joining um, in the summer, in the summer months. Uh, it's always tempting for us to think, oh, well, maybe everyone's away on a summer break, but then also very conscious that lots of people for various reasons can't be. So uh, it's really great to have you with us. Um, and we're particularly um, grateful for you coming if this is your first time. This might be not just your first time at one of our webinars, but perhaps your first interaction with us at, uh, at RDS. Um, and so particularly warm welcome um, to you. And I guess a reminder that uh, we love webinars. They're great. They're great for enabling people to join uh, from wherever, uh, uh, from holiday in some instances uh, for some of our um, speakers. Um, but we are conscious that also they don't, it's it's only one small part of what we do. Nikki's already mentioned the one-to-one -one support, um, which is available um, to members of RDS. Um, but also most of our meetings um, uh, are in person again now. And so what you'll hear today is a great opportunity to hear other people's stories and experiences um, through some pre-prepared videos and some live questions and answers at the end. But we're conscious that, especially if you're here for the first time, then what, what you're missing is that warm cup of coffee and someone to shake your hand and uh, welcome you in to what might be a new experience and uh, something you might be slightly reeling from the news that PCA is going to be a part of your life. Um, so just to remind you that in addition to the one-to-one -one support, we also have fantastic um, monthly um, peer groups, uh, which are run by members of the team, um, but also really importantly, um, a big in-person meetings where there's the opportunity for you to get together um, and chat informally with other people who perhaps might be going through a similar thing uh, at a similar time um, with whom you can share anything or everything about your experience and hopefully make connections and friendships um, that will uh, last for many months to come. Um, so today, just to get back to our agenda, um, we've got, uh, I think, four short videos um, and covering a whole variety of topics. So starting off with a nice uh, scientific summary from Keir Yong to give you a little bit of an update about what's happening in the world of PCA, um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia more generally. Um, following a recent scientific conference. Um, some uh, contributions from Charlie Harrison, our artist and arts consultant who works at RDS, um, talking about uh, creative opportunities and community, op community building within RDS. Um, a fantastic update from uh, Helena and David Clark um, and Karen Tapson about their experiences of being part of the RDS um, Rare Space Garden, um, uh, hosted by the National Brain Appeal at the Chelsea Flower Show. Um, some discussion from Emily Brotherhood about um, research opportunities that are available at the moment, and then a panel discussion, um, including several of the speakers and also our friend and colleague, uh, Professor Jonathan Schott, who will be here to answer uh, all of your questions and queries. Uh, you can make them, particularly with John here, you can make those questions as, as difficult and awkward as you like. Um, uh, we try and put him on the spot, but he always rises to the occasion. So um, I hope you can sit back and relax with a nice warm cup of tea or coffee um, and listen to our speakers as they come through. And then uh, Nikki and I will shepherd you through the meeting. Um, before we close out at around 11.30ish. Um, uh, Nikki, before I do any housekeeping uh, announcements, anything else you'd like to add or say? No, just to say if anybody does have to pop out while the meeting's on, it will be recorded, so we will be getting it sent off after to you, and you can always contact us with sort of special bits that you did miss so we can sort of get some de extra details to you. So please don't feel that you have to sit still for the next hour and a half wait watching us intently. 
absolutely and we'll also be sharing in addition to those recordings that, that will go out in a couple of weeks or so and um, we'll also send um, any notes or slides um, that, that appear so that you don't have to sit there um, scribbling notes or thinking you're going to miss things um just one final um uh, point to mention is at the bottom of your screen if you waggle your mouse um, within your zoom screen there's a q a box um so although the um, question answer session won't happen till um, the end of the meeting at about 11 o'clock um, you're welcome at any point during the meeting as someone's talking if something isn't clear feel please feel free to pop your questions and answers in there and we'll either address those during the panel um, sometimes um, by text in between um, or we'll wrap up things that we don't get to cover during the meeting um, um, in our in our email in a couple of couple of weeks time so don't but don't be sat there feeling uncertain is is the short message and use that Q&A box for us to try and help clarify things for you. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to, uh, I, I sorry, I should have said a huge thank you in addition to Nikki to um, Sam Rossi Harris uh, and Claire Waddington who are doing lots of hard work behind the scenes, um, preparing the meeting, inviting you all, making sure the tech works um, and doing a fantastic job. Um, and I believe Sam is now going to queue up a video from our friend Keir Yong, who's going to give you a little bit of a scientific summary and update. Um, and we can, even though Keir is not with us in person today, um, you can, um, any questions that arise from this, we can throw over to the likes of John during the question and answer session. So um, over to Keir. My name's Keir. I'm an Etherington PCA Senior Research Fellow, and Seb and I lead the University College London study of posterior cortical atrophy. I'm going to share topics covered at Alzheimer's Association's International Conference in Amsterdam last month. You may have noticed news articles around the time describing this as a turning point in the development of novel therapies targeting Alzheimer's disease pathology. Alzheimer's disease pathology is the most common cause of posterior cortical atrophy. While there were talks on a variety of topics, ranging from prevention strategies, equitable care, to topics, say, like understanding the role of genetics and inflammation, I'll be focusing on two emerging therapies targeting amyloid, so-called disease-modifying therapies, which received a lot of international attention. While there are a number of pharmacological therapies already in use in the United Kingdom, for example, denepazil and amantine, these are considered to have symptomatic benefit, but without targeting the underlying disease. To disclose, my background is primarily in PCA research, not in, say, molecules or proteins, and I'm not a clinician. But in my capacity as a researcher, there were two headline messages which emerged on these disease-modifying therapies. Number one, there's evidence that reducing a key pathologic feature of Alzheimer's disease, amyloid, results in slowing of clinical progression in people with mild Alzheimer's disease. There's evidence from not one, but two therapies which has been released in the last year. While both are anti-amyloid immunotherapies, these in fact have slightly different properties. The first, lacanumab, binds particularly to amyloid beta protofibrils, a soluble toxic form of amyloid, while denanumab reduces existing clumps of amyloid beta plaques. Other therapies targeting not only amyloid, but also tau and inflammation are in various stages of clinical trials and seeking approvals. Number two, there's a lot that we don't know at this point. Some unknowns include how benefits might be sustained outside the clinical trial period, how safe and effective these therapies might be when rolled out to a greater number of people, as well as the availability of these treatments within the United Kingdom. But in short, there was an unmistakable feeling of entering a different era of Alzheimer's disease research. Now, in detail, clinical trials provided evidence that both denanumab and lacanumab not only reduce amyloid, but also slow clinical progression by around a quarter to a third over an 18-month period relative to a placebo group. 
one way this has been presented is saying that this might be comparable to five to seven months of time saved in terms of slowed symptom progression over the course of the trial compared to being on placebo. These conference presentations are typically very serious and solemn. Talks reflect years, if not decades of research. But in the room, evidence of clinical efficacy was met with applause and cheers by attendees. Adding to the sense of this being a milestone in Alzheimer's disease research, the following day involved a session on appropriate use recommendations on how to safely administer one of these two drugs, which is lacanamab. While still emphasizing the clinical benefits of lacanamab, the appropriate use recommendations group emphasized a sobering aspect of both drugs, which is safety and side effects. Abnormalities related to removing amyloid on MRI scans, so-called amyloid-relating imaging abnormalities, were documented in about a sixth of participants overall on lacanamab and a third of participants overall on denanamab. There are a few things to note about these imaging abnormalities. Firstly, these mostly did not appear to result in symptoms. For the minority of abnormalities resulting in symptoms, these were mostly headaches, dizziness, and confusion. Secondly, there is evidence that risk of these imaging abnormalities depends on the strongest genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease, the APOE E4 allele. For people on lacanamab who had no copies of this APOE E4 allele, one in 20 had imaging abnormalities. For people who carried two copies of this risk allele, one in three had imaging abnormalities. People on denanamab showed a similar pattern with the likelihood of imaging abnormalities increasing with each APOE E4 allele. Thirdly, there's evidence that risk of these imaging abnormalities depends on certain medications and vascular factors. Anticoagulants appear to increase risk of hemorrhage for people on lacanamab. For denanamab, imaging abnormalities were comparable with and without anticoagulants or other antithrombotic drugs. These risks meant that the current lacanamab appropriate use recommendations included limited administration to people off anticoagulants and people with mild or no evidence of cerebrovascular disease. While lacanamab has received full approval from the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, denanamab approvals and recommendations are still pending. To monitor risks and safety, genetic, genetic testing for the APOE E4 allele is most likely going to be recommended for both drugs alongside long-term follow-up. The need to proceed safety, safely was something very carefully emphasized. While rare, serious hemorrhages and deaths were documented in at least one in 200 people on either new therapy. This meant that the decision to treat might depend on other medical conditions, for example, diabetes, hypertension, or psychiatric conditions being well-managed. Now I'm going to finish off with what this might mean for people with posterior cortical atrophy and for people in the United Kingdom. Now to recap, the most common cause of posterior cortical atrophy is Alzheimer's disease pathology, these amyloid plaques and tau tangles. I mentioned how the strongest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, the APOE E4 allele, was associated with increased risk of imaging abnormalities. While people with PCA are less likely to carry copies of this APOE E4 allele compared to people with memory and Alzheimer's disease overall, they may still carry one or rarely two copies of this allele. While people with PCA tend to be younger overall and thus may be less likely to have cerebrovascular disease and perhaps potentially contraindicated medications, there's still a number of individual factors which would need to be taken into consideration when considering who's appropriate and safe to treat. But what does this actually mean in the UK? So decisions on approval on both drugs are due by the MHRA and the National Institute of Clinical Excellence by end of next year. 
was worth considering some practicalities here and to get a better sense of practicalities at other centres. Uh, here at University College London, we organised two conferences early this year where we had international experts speaking on their experience in the United States and in the Netherlands. A common consideration is that these disease modifying therapies will have unprecedented implications for dementia services in the United States, UK and elsewhere. These implications range from the need for specialist techniques, as well as professionals time and training. As examples, firstly, as both of these therapies target amyloid, treatment will require evidence that someone's symptoms are attributable to amyloid through so-called biological markers or biomarkers. These biomarkers are currently largely restricted to specialist centers. These mostly involve lumbar punctures and very rarely amyloid PET scans. The more scalable blood biomarkers are anticipated in the coming few years. Secondly, these treatments require regular transfusions rather than, say, oral tablets. Thirdly, as mentioned, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities are common and these will need to be monitored. In the near term, this will likely require repeated MRI scans. The above have implications for staff and costs beyond costs of the treatment itself. At a time where, frankly, the NHS feels under more pressures than any time that I can remember. While these might feel formidable, there are precedents in how the NHS has made substantive advances in treating neurological conditions such as multiple sclerosis and stroke. At least in my perspective as a researcher, in the past five to 10 years, we've seen unprecedented advances in our understanding of Alzheimer's disease and of posterior cortical atrophy. While these recent developments in therapies at most offer a means to slow rather than stop progression, and we don't currently know how, when, and to who they will be available in the UK, there is this palpable feeling of approaching a different chapter. Perhaps a balanced take was offered by Professor John Hardy. He mentioned that while this certainly might not represent the end, it might be the end of the beginning in the race towards more effective treatments, and said this marked a historic moment in Alzheimer's research. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for Takir, um, who's very sorry not to be able um, to, to be with us in person today, but sends his warmest regards. Um, and I think he's captured really well there, really quite a complex picture um, in a very short number of words. And it's something that uh, some several of your questions that are already coming in um, and which uh, John Schott in particular will speak to a little bit later. But I just wanted to reiterate, and maybe Nikki will also comment, we were also both there um, and sensed that contrast that Kia mentions between meetings that are usually solemn and sober suddenly being filled with um, uh, slightly teenagery whooping and cheering. Um, and there are many challenges, as Kia has outlined, um, to be faced, not least making sure that these treatments, as and when they're approved, um, can be available equitably, um, no matter who you are, no matter where you are. Um, but this really is, I will declare my aging nature, I've been in this field for 24 years this summer. Uh, in fact, 24 years, two days ago, I started my job at the Dementia Research Centre. And I cannot recall a single moment in those 24 years, which is like this, where people actually feel like um, there's been a milestone reached and a step forward. Of course, there've been many achievements, huge amount of understanding of these complex diseases, um, but small increments rather than this sense of a breakthrough. And whilst that doesn't mean that the road ahead is smooth by any chance, um, it does mean that hope is sort of preserved in the field, the greatest risk was not only that the big pharmaceutical companies who spend often a hundred million dollars on a trial, which up until now has largely been unsuccessful, but arguably more importantly, people like yourselves 
who give up huge amounts of time um, and effort and invest huge amounts of your own hope in these sorts of treatments and trials might be disconcerted that we all might gradually feel that there's no chance of changing these kind of diseases and this is one of those moments which is important not just for the specific benefits it might have for people with Alzheimer's disease who are eligible for the treatment but more broadly across all of the degenerative conditions where we start to genuinely believe that these diseases are tractable that they're changeable um, and that with the right investment the right time the right ingenuity um, that we can modify and slow down some of these conditions. Um, so I think a, a real moment for hope. Nikki, you were there. I don't know if you felt the same, similar sense of buzz in the room. Yeah, it was really interesting. As I said, said, he's been in this field for a long time, which I'd like to say makes him so much older than me, but unfortunately <laughs> that's not true. But it was my first time at a big conference, which was really exciting for me. And to be at a conference where there was so much excitement and hope around was really, you know, just such a thrilling experience. I think what I want to add on to that with the conference from my perspective is how much more is going on in, in research as well now with uh, patient and uh, participation involvement and really involving you know, our members, whether they're here or all over the world, in everything we do. And that was really apparent at the conference after speaking to people and telling them about our services, how, how you know, don't really want to be big headed about it but how we really want to include everybody in everything we do and you know you'll hear a bit later from David and Helena about Chelsea and so many of this PCA group were so integral to making that right for us we really felt that that was the core of what we wanted and that really was so evident sort of of what we should be doing from the conference and what was also really lovely with the conference as well was the support element this time and going along with all the you know the clinical developments and all that's happening and what's going to be happening in the future support is pivotal with that you know we 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 can't do trials without supporting people properly and this is this was really evident of now we're going to really bring the support element in alongside the clinical to make it such a more holistic experience for everyone. So for me, it was fantastic to see that in action and to feel that we are doing things in the right direction at RDS because we had a wonderful poster there and so many people come to speak to us about the services and wow, isn't that great? So let's hope this replicates all over the world. Absolutely, here, here. Great. Well, moving uh, from science, the sciences to the arts, but always uh, uh, fantastically recognizing the connections between the two. Um, it's great now to be able to introduce a short video by Charlie Harrison, um, a visual artist who I think a number of you will have had, I hope, the privilege of, of working with um, a real inspirational figure within RDS. Um, and someone who I won't I won't date him or age him. He's certainly much younger than me, but who's shown a, an enormous commitment um, to building community within the Rare Dementia Support uh, membership over many years, um, and has a fantastic array of exciting new projects. Um, hopefully, to strengthen those links around the country. Obviously, RDS started as a tiny hospital charity just for people from one clinic in one hospital in London. Um, and whilst our ambitions are big, um, we are growing, uh, we hope, into an, into an oak from an acorn. Um, and so haven't reached everyone yet. Charlie's going to describe a number of initiatives um, which aim to draw people in and to create opportunities for connection between people living in different areas, in different places and, and far beyond the UK. Um, so I will hand over to Charlie and his video and then Charlie will join us on the panel a little bit later on. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name's Charlie Harrison. I'm my background as a visual artist, um, but I've also been working with Rare Dementia Support and uh, the Dementia Research Centre for about the last 10 years on several creative projects. Um, some of you I already know really well and everyone else, I'm looking forward to getting to know you better in the future as well. Um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about a new venture for Rare Dementia Support called Rare Space, 
Um, so this is the place where we're going to be sharing member stories, activities and projects, um, as well as research centred around creative and cultural life of um, RDS members. So I thought the easiest way to introduce this might be to give you a bit of a tour of our new microsite. Um, and this can be accessed through the main RDS website. So I'll just share my screen. Okay, so here's the main RDS website and you can find the rare space um, microsites under this community tab. Um, this will take you to the new microsite which includes all the details. Um, and if you want to navigate back to the main website, there is this button here that says return to RDS. So this is a home page, and there's this lovely picture of an RDS member called Lionel that I worked with a little while ago. And in the picture, he's talking about some of his paintings. Um, Lionel actually had a language-based dementia, but it was always so wonderful to hear him talking so enthusiastically about his artwork even when it was a challenge for him to get his words out. I think I just wanted to mention this to emphasize how important creativity can be for communicating with each other in ways that don't always have to involve words. Um, this is an aspect of creative projects that has also been expressed to me by many people living with PCA as well. Um, and next to this, we have these three words, um, support creative culture. And really, this is what we're looking to do. Um, we want to learn from and be guided by the unique perspectives of our members. We're aiming to help people to continue their life and to carry on doing the things they enjoy, um, whilst also opening up new opportunities for connection and communication with others. So if it's not too much of a cliche, we're hoping that through creativity, we can break down barriers and assumptions and share real experiences of what it's like to live with or care for someone with a rare dementia. That isn't what you would normally read about in the media or maybe in a scientific, text, scientific textbook. Um, so just quickly to look at the about page. Um, so this has a bit more information, especially about the cultural life of RDS. And in particular, we're thinking of what this means um, as we work towards the planned rare dementia support center, which I'm sure many of you will have heard about. Um, the center will be the first ever center for people living with or caring for someone with a rare dementia. And we want to build a culture space and set of activities that reflects our membership. Um, it's obviously still very early stages, but we do want to start thinking about how people might want to use the space. Um, so we'd really like to hear from you about this. Um, also on this about page is the story so far, um, which gives some background to the many projects we've been involved with, along with alongside RDS members in the past. Um, so it, for example, there's a brilliant, do I see what you see? Um, film by Simon Ball, which was made alongside people living with PCA. And this has really just been such a powerful tool for communicating the reality of a PCA diagnosis to the public and to professionals as well. Um, and below this, there's also a link to an online course um, that we developed about arts and dementia. Um, and I can highly recommend this. And then at the bottom, there's a very cheesy picture of me, which I think we'll move on quite quickly from. Uh, so under this stories tab at the top here. So when we were putting this together, we wanted to start off by hearing from our members. And in the story, this story section, um, you'll see a selection of stories from our members who have been chatting to, to get a better understanding of what creativity means to them. Um, I'm sure many of you already know Helena and David, and in their story, you can read more about the impact of Helena's PCA diagnosis and the different ways that creativity has played a part in their journey. Um, so there's some of Helena's lovely drawings and paintings. Um, and they also talk about the importance of their garden and things like cooking or swimming. Um, I'm also always really happy to see pictures of people's pets. So I was really pleased when uh, Helena and David sent me this lovely picture of their dog Molly in their garden, which they're rewilding. Um, 
So I'd really encourage you to have a look at um, Helena and David's page on the website. And I just also want to say thank you so much to them for being so open to sharing their story, which I think is really, really powerful. We're just moving on to the project section at the top here. Um, I really just wanted to emphasize that um, we're not just thinking about creativity and culture in terms of arts and crafts. Um, we're really keen to know more about all the things that our members are passionate about. Um, and to give another example, um, in this project section, you'll see that last year we started a partnership with the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust and ran some sessions at the London Wetlands Centre to engage people in walking and the natural surroundings. So there's some really great photos um, and words on this page. And it was just so nice um, for this group of people to come together in this way. And um, yeah, we really got out there and tried lots of things. There's some barefoot walking here, um, some pictures of people eating berries, um, a bit of tree hugging, of course. Um, and yeah, and we just, we, we got out there, you know, even when it was raining and it, it was just such a lovely, lovely project. Um, so we're now talking a bit more with the Wildfowl and Wetland Trust about volunteering opportunities for RDS members. And we're really thinking um, of these sorts of projects in line with the RDS Champions Scheme, which you might have already heard about. Um, if you haven't already about, heard about the RDS Champions, it's a new volunteering initiative at RDS. Um, and we're hoping to find more opportunities for our members to get out into their communities and give talks or get involved with events. Um, both to share information about rare dementias like PCA, um, but also to make more connections in their communities. Um, one way this is linking up with rare space is that we're making lots of new partnerships with org organisations around the UK, like um, the World Fell and Wetlands Trust, um, but also with arts organisations like Sweet Patootie Arts, um, who are currently touring a film about Black Caribbean heritage, um, and the experience of this community after the First World War. So you can read more about that here in the project page. Um, and it's not on the website yet, um, but we're also currently partnering with football clubs around the UK. Um, and in the next few weeks, some RDS members living with PCA and I are hoping to visit Derby County Football Club, who run lots of brilliant activities in their community. Um, these members are really big Derby County fans, and I'm actually a Nottingham Forest supporter, so this might be a little bit tense, um, but hopefully some things are more important and can overcome these sorts of rivalries. Also, just quickly to mention that some of you might have been involved um, in a research project as part of the um, RDS Impact research a couple of years ago. Um, and this project was called Talking Lines, and it involved drawing lines to describe different aspects of diagnosis and support. Um, we're really pleased um, that, uh, that the sort of outputs from this research are going to be um, in a public exhibition at the new Drawing Room Gallery um, Library in Bermondsey, um, and this will open on the 22nd of September. Um, there's also going to be a workshop and a panel discussion in October, so if you'd be interested in coming along to this, um, please check this page um, for updates. So just to emphasise again that we aren't just interested in the everyday types of creativity um, that you might normally think of, but we want to hear about all sorts of activities. Um, it could be cooking or baking, it could be sitting in your shed or tinkering with engines, it could be making a hedgehog house in your garden. Um, really what we're most interested in is supporting you to keep doing the things that you enjoy and also to use these passions and this energy to help raise awareness of rare dementias like PCA. Um, so do get in touch with us. Um, we currently have really limited resources for this work um, and we won't be able to do everything, but if it sounds like your cup of tea, um, we'd be delighted to hear your thoughts and ideas. Um, so that's great. Um, so that's it from me. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to being part of the panel and yeah, do ask any questions and get in touch if you'd like to.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Charlie. And as Charlie mentioned, he'll be um, joining our panel discussion in a few minutes time. Um, so please do, as he encourages you to think of any comments and questions that you'd like to uh, throw over to him or ideas for um, the future. Um, and I just wanted to emphasise uh, again, as Charlie did towards the end there, that this is all forms of, of creativity and of activity, not just the usuals. And we're interested, and that includes everyday creativity that you may have been involved in, which has been about addressing problems or challenges that you face and not not just sort of physical and technological challenges um, such as adaptations to the home or how you're moving lighting around in order to um, make things easier although we're always interested in that too but also sort of social solutions how you might you and your friends and your family might be adapting the way you converse and spend time together and to get around challenges that you've experienced whether that's with word finding or you know the struggles that many people comment on about having um, difficulty kind of following a conversation when the sounds are coming from from different places and um, because as we always say um, we talk about PCA as being the visual dementia but it's far far more than that um, and there are many other sensory skills um, that are also um, impacted by this condition so anything that you have experienced as a challenge and if um found a solution to or on on your way to grappling with uh, we're very keen to hear hear those stories and 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 follow that progress so thank you for anything you can share okay so now we will hand on to uh, helena and david who you had mentioned just a moment ago by charlie um, in conversation with uh, the wonderful karen tapson uh, and talking a little bit about their experiences of contributing uh, to a recent project at the RHS uh, Chelsea Flower Show. Um, so I will hand over to Sam to queue up that video and uh, just to encourage you that Helena and David and Karen will also be um, on the panel at the end. So if you have questions or comments, but also want to just perhaps share similar experiences um, that you'd like me to, to read out when we get to the uh, Q&A, please do feel uh, free to share those in the Q&A box. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Karen and I work in the direct support team and I am delighted to be here today with our members, Helena and David. Hello. Hi. Hello. Lovely to see you. Well, we're here uh, to talk all things gardens and Chelsea Flower Show today. So, first of all, a little bit of history and background about the garden. It is with huge thanks to the amazing hard work of the team at the National Brain Appeal, who are our funders at RDS. And they managed to secure funding for our garden, Rare Space, at Chelsea Flower Show. They secured the funding from a project called Project Giving Back, which is an initiative which gives UK charities the chance to promote their causes with the garden. We will always be grateful to Project Giving Back for their kind support. So that's how we have the huge privilege of having our special sanctuary garden rare space at Chelsea Flower Show. So with the funding in place, the next bit was to find a gardener. Nikki said it was a bit like speed dating. Members of the team got together and chatted with different gardens. And by all accounts, the very special Charlie Hawks really got it. He realized it was gonna be a huge challenge and he really wanted to embrace it. He created some basic designs and shared them with Nikki and Seb. They worked with Charlie to help him understand what may impact a person living with PCA in a garden, what would be good, what to avoid, and then he created some basic designs. And he got our lovely members living with PCA, including Helena and David as well, um, he got their comments and that helped the garden as it was at Chelsea Flower Show. So, Helena, when did you first meet Charlie? Um, it was I am in the depths of winter and it was very cold and we were in, in um, Queen Square. And yes, that's we, when we first met. We went it. up to Queen Square to for some um, uh, you know, photo call basically to, for the first publicity material um, for it and. Uh, Charlie was there, and, and uh, it was a it was a nice day, but a very cold day. And we spent an hour in in Queen Square Garden, 
um, with the photographer and uh, and Charlie, and uh, which was lovely. Um, so yeah, we we were able to um, uh, give him some so our thoughts on his garden, but he he, he immediately struck us as a very very nice uh, nice person to work with. Thank you. And um, did Charlie take on board your comments um, as the process continued? Yes, definitely. I, yeah, I, I always felt that he, you know, was you know taking, um, well, I suppose particularly my point of view into consideration. Yes. Yeah, I think there were there were two things that that I think we brought up that you know he seemed to latch onto. One was, you know, Helena um, likes to see. Um, grasses wafting, tall things that move, things that move rather than staying still. So that was one thing I think may have um, reinforced some of his ideas. Um, but something very specific was the um, the water feature, which he had planned as something with, uh, you know, sort of uh, slab sides of flowing water that create a, a completely um, flat surface, a shiny surface and a reflective surface. And of course, that's that's not good for PCA, and so uh, he took that on board and uh, and changed the feature so that it had um, uh, a, a textured surface, and it made the the water uh, ripple, and but but not be a shiny surface, but it created noise, which again is important um, as a, as a sort of uh, marker of things in the garden. So it wasn't so much this sort of shiny feature. So that that was. The very specific thing and he remembered that when we saw him at the garden he said look yeah. this is how it's turned out <laughs> yeah yeah it was wonderful actually and i remember visiting the garden and seeing as you walked meandered around the garden you saw these sort of hidden water features really and you could mm. hear the sound of the water which was really really special because with chelsea flower show it's really important in the gardens from a technical point of view that there is a water feature so i think charlie did really well didn't he you know thinking about how PCA affects people, um, but still had that lovely sound um, of the water. And I saw the grooves as well, and it looked beautiful. So thank you for that. So you were at Chelsea Flower Show when all the cele celebrities were there on the Monday. Who did you were, you yes, that was exciting. Yeah. Yes. So uh, yes, uh, uh, Stephen Graham was there, and he was such a lovely man really really nice guy um yeah, yeah he was he, he was really sort of the, the press there were always cameras uh, around and the press were all trying basically to get shots of him because he was the, the celebrity there and they didn't really want anybody else they didn't want us they didn't want the uh, national brain appeal people um but he he sort of clung to somebody else in the group on the garden at all times so nobody could get a shot of him just on his own and uh yeah he was he was really you know telling the, the the press guys off and saying look you know this isn't about me <laughs> sort of but also he said at one point um he said to us um and the, and the um, paparazzi we all were around and um and he was like i don't want i don't want to talk to you i don't want to talk to you i want to talk to these people which was david and me yeah yeah and that was i i got, that was really you know, I don't know, it was really lovely that he was like, actually, these are the important people. And Joanna David was on the um, on there as well. And she's she, she was lovely, um, made us feel very welcome. You know, she as, did. Sort of she a, was lovely. Um, yeah, sort of. Uh, yeah, obviously, she's involved with the National Brain Appeals, you know, sort of directly, I think, has been for a long time. So uh, that was good. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then we were. We were getting a bit hungry. Yes, we went off for lunch. Um, we were queuing up for a sandwich and uh, um, Marie from the National Brain Appeal called me on my mobile and I thought, oh, you know, what's going on? And, um, and I never thought I was going to hear this, but she said, can you come back to the garden? Joanna Lumley wants to talk to Helena. <laughs> and uh, oh, this was, this David was great, was in, I thought. Yes. Yeah, David was in seventh heaven. <laughs> so we... Uh, we, we abandoned our queue for the sandwich and, and hurried back and then found by then she um, uh, she'd been uh, waylaid in the next sanctuary garden where she was doing the interview that appeared on the first night of the BBC coverage. Um, then after that, she came and we sat on a bench in the um, uh, in our garden, in our garden and, yes. uh, uh, and had a really nice chat for about 15 minutes. And she was really interested in PCA and, and uh, um, I mean, she was just 
really nice, wasn't she? She so, was. Yeah. She was. Yeah. So that was well, very exciting. Yes. Yeah. We did hear, David, that you did <laughs> the soft spot for Joanna Lovett. Yes, 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 so yes, pleased yes. you got to meet her. Yes. And I must say, I did watch that coverage that evening of the BBC. It was the first Chelsea programme. So I was thrilled because I spotted the both of you on the telly. Um, and then I heard Joanna Lumley speak. As you say, she was in the next sanctuary garden. Mm. She spoke so beautifully about our garden, saying that she had not realised that there was a dementia that could affect somebody's sight, the way they saw the world, and with perception difficulties as well. So she really did showcase our garden. So, yes. Yeah. The coverage was part. was really good because we, we had um, there was somebody we meet uh, out walking the dog Mm. who on the next day I, I bumped into her and she said I saw Helen on the telly <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, we've had press in the local yeah, we've had coverage local. in the local press and people have said oh I saw you in the paper and you know so there's it's it's really gone yeah. out there the uh, um uh, the you know Marie did has done a really good job of getting getting publicity and people have seen it which is which is good it does yeah. feel slightly strange that you know our situation is is out there in the in the in the public domain sort of locally but on, on the other hand it's sort of that, that's sort of quite good in a way because this is our reality and uh, um you know so uh, yeah it's been yeah. quite exciting yeah absolutely now i understand that we mm. were on the telly our garden was on the telly eight times that week which is as you say amazing wow. coverage to yeah. raise awareness of pca and yeah. i volunteered a lot in the garden over the week i was there to be there and enjoy it um as a guest but also volunteered a lot and i believe we handed out i think it was twenty five thousand rare space brochures during the course of the week, which again is a really wonderful when it comes to raising yeah. awareness of PCA. That, that's incredible. Yeah. So Charlie did really well. Would you like to tell us about his medal and the awards that he received? Yeah, it, we we're on the day, of course, they do the judging um, on the Sunday, I think it is. We're there, we're there on the Monday, on the press day. Um, and then the, the results of the judging are not announced until the, the Tuesday morning. So the gardeners are all in this state of anxiety, and we could really sense that with Charlie. Yeah, he, he was, was sort of really proud of this, but he just it was still like waiting for the exam results, sort of thing. And uh, so the following morning, when um, uh, somebody sent us the, the first sort of message that he's won gold, you know, we were so pleased with it yeah. because, uh, and thought that was great. And then later on, we heard he'd won um, the, the, the two other awards for the best sanctuary garden and the best um construction in the sanctuary garden so he really took the you know he got the clean sweep mm -hmm. um and uh that was a real achievement you know so uh yes it, it was um and we were so pleased yes really it's, pleased. Uh, you know we would have been you know so disappointed for him if we only met, met him a couple of times but you know it, it uh it felt like um you know he was one of our sons i suppose <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Do you guys have a favourite flower in the garden? Mm, well, I think the azalea. Yes, there was a there's a a, um, uh, a yellow azalea, and there were a couple of them. And the um, the aroma, the smell from this oh, plant was, was amazing. amazing. The whole of Chelsea has got that smell. You know, yeah. you come in and you think, wow, you know. But the, when you got into to our garden, there were, it was just it was. A, I, I quite often find. Um, you know, garden two hour you know, flowers two hour aromatic i um i find them a bit sort of overwhelming but it was just it was a beautiful but intense and really powerful smell and uh but the whole thing of being in the garden in fact it, it was you felt completely separate you from did. all the people who were walking past outside mm -hmm. and i never quite appreciated that before how how the experience of being on the garden you know inside it um could be so totally different from viewing just from the outside and uh, uh, I think the intensity of the, um, the, the the smell from the azalea might have been part of that. So, yeah, yeah. It's um, and I, of course he got the timing of that just right. Got that in that state um, because um, uh, you know that wouldn't have been in flower that long and then mm -hmm. all over. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, 
yeah just shows what an amazing gardener he was um and my favorite as well was those four yellow azaleas they were absolutely beautiful i asked charlie how old they were actually because i hadn't seen um that kind of yellowy color azalea other than a very small bush and he said they were about seven years old oh, yeah. and, um one rds member came up to me in the show and he said that it looked like large yellow puffy clouds and he felt that really helped somebody living with pca sort of navigate their way around the garden so i thought that was really lovely to hear yeah yeah definitely mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you've already touched on what it was like sitting in the garden that kind of sanctuary uh, that you just really don't realize because there's just so many people sort of hundreds and hundreds of people looking in the garden um, and then when you get in it, as you said, it's like a sanctuary and so many members came to visit us and we were able to bring them in and their overwhelming uh, feedback was how peaceful and calm the space was, um, mm. even though there were so many people around. Mm. So that was really, really special. And one member said to me, I don't know if this resonates with you, Helena, is that as soon as the breeze came, she could see the iris moving and said it was so special. And I think that goes with that planting that you were talking about. Yeah. So things that move in the breeze. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. After the show, the gardens have got to be moved. You don't think about that when you go and visit Chelsea uh, Flower Show so our very special garden needed to be moved and it's huge thanks to marcus and kate Aegis, and they're taking care of our garden at exbury gardens in southampton until we can bring our special garden back to our offices um, in london when they're ready for it so they're not quite ready but in the meantime rds members can visit exbury free of charge and all the information about that will come out in the next 10 to 14 days with the information from the webinar um, you just have to write to an email address and you'll get tickets so you can go. So I do think that's a, a lovely thing to do if you can go and see our garden. Thank yeah. you so much for chatting with me today about our very special garden. And thank you both for all your contributions and your support. Um, thank you to all of our members living with PCA that contributed um, to make the garden so dementia friendly um, and to really help people understand the way somebody living with PCA um, might struggle um, in their environments. So it really is time to hand back to Seb. And I'm happy to say that both of you are going to be joining us at the Q&A shortly so we can answer any questions anybody might have about our garden at Chelsea. Thanks, guys, and see you in a minute. OK, hey. thank you. Bye. Fantastic. Thanks so much to Helena, David and Karen for that great interview and a wonderful summary of what was a really uh, entertaining and but also really powerful uh, week about communicating the message of PCA and other rarer forms of dementia. Um, I just um, wanted to say before I hand over to Nikki, who was there on the press day and experienced how generally brilliant uh, a human being Stephen Graham is, um, just to big up uh, Charlie Hawkes, the garden designer, and to underline what Karen, David and Helen were all saying about him really listening to the experiences of people who actually know what we're talking about. Because just to emphasize, I don't live with PCA. I'm not, I'm called an expert in PCA, and it's not true. All I am is a, a mouthpiece, um, the likes of me, Keir and Nikki to some extent, for the experiences that you often generously share with us. Um, and that and it and it's those experiences that Charlie was really keyed into listening to. He was, he of course, spoke to members of the team, but it was the members of the um, PCA community that he wanted to hear from. And so many, as as they gave the example of the moving grasses, but also the the kind of the pops of colour, both within the planting, but in the bands around the edges of the benches where people can sit, as well, were all ideas that came through. Uh, from people actually living with PCA. So it genuinely an example of what's called co-production or co-design um, in action. And it, and it isn't a given. Um, we talk about that word co-production quite a lot, but I was party to this speed dating exercise with different garden designers. And there, it was quite clear that quite a few of the garden designers we spoke to had a, had a clear vision in mind and they wanted to design their garden and wanted this scheme to be a sort of vehicle for them to get that garden funded. Uh, whereas Charlie was very, very open to saying, I've got some ideas, but they really need to be shaped and led by the people who who actually know what it is to live with PCA. 
Um, and so it's in some ways a subtle difference, but a really, really important one. And the garden wouldn't have been anywhere near as good um, had it not been for the experience and shared stories um, of and ideas of people like Helen and David. Um, the one other shout out I wanted to make was particularly to Anna McLeod, who alongside other teammates like Eva Tate um, and Marie Mang and other people at the fantastic uh, National Brain Appeal um, charity team really made the whole event happen and worked unbelievably hard in the short amount of time I was there and I was juggling the 25,000 brochures that, that Karen mentioned, whilst also taking um, sort of phone calls from the private protection officers to former prime ministers who were visiting the site um, and spreading the word for us. So a huge array of different skills and talents needed and the whole team put in a, a really stellar effort um, and, were, and it wouldn't be, and without that effort, it wouldn't, the message of the garden and, and awareness of PCA wouldn't have been a, a, a raise, a, raised in the way that it was. So Nikki, any other reflections yourself on that wonderful week? Yeah, it was such a wonderful week. And um, I'm just going to put it out there now that I don't go speed dating. I know Karen <laughs> actually sort of said, and me and Seb certainly don't, don't go speed dating together. So just in case anybody's worried about that. Um, but we had a really wonderful week and I was really honoured to be there on the press day. So I had my celebrity stalker t-shirt on and basically grabbed anybody who looked slightly important to get into our garden to actually have a feel with the have a talk with Helena and David um it was just great we had so many celebrities that were really interested in learning about it which was amazing Stephen Graham I've known for a while and he is absolutely fantastic he is such a fan of RDS he came to us initially when he started the film um help to get some in, input of what it's like to live with a young onset dementia and especially PCA and he met with so many of our members and he remembered them all at the, at the garden he was asking all about them which was wonderful um and he really truly was there for the people living with PCA that day and for RDS he really wasn't interested in speaking to the press as Helena said so that was brilliant um so many of our members were involved. Martina was really helpful in meeting with Charlie in the beginning to talk about plants and colours and things. Joy and Jason were there that week and Joy, who is absolutely wonderful, she really is, and she she's quite impaired in some aspects now with her visual perception and struggles with walking and the first thing she said to me is what a lovely path that is I feel so safe on this path I can see the colors oh look at that water feature she she felt so safe and in at peace within the garden and it this was just a real feeling and a, such an achievement to Charlie that he got it completely right. So huge, huge thanks to Charlie. A fantastic achievement and such an honour to be part of it. Great, thank you. So a little bit more of that later in the Q&A, but for now I'm going to hand on to uh, Emily Brotherhood, a fantastic uh, research fellow um, at the Dementia Research Centre and the RDS team, uh, known to many of you, who's going to tell you a little bit about our current projects and opportunities for taking part. Um, Emily, over to you, live, not just a video, actual live Emily. Hello, good morning everyone. I'm sorry I can't see you all, but yes, uh, hello to all 57 of us in the audience. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and then we can begin. Um, so yes, thank you for the introduction, Seb. Um, so as he mentioned, this is the part of the webinar about how you can get involved in some of the research that's currently happening. So some of the uh, very astute of you might remember this presentation because it did feature actually in the PCA annual seminar earlier this year. And this was where we invited you to complete a survey to help us design better online support programs for people experiencing PCA. And um, so I'm really pleased to say that from that and from some other emails that have come out since then, we've had lots of responses through. And um, so if anyone's uh, sitting in the audience thinking, oh, I've already done this, a huge thank you to those of you who have um, taken the time and energy. And we're still looking for some more responses. So I'm here to invite any of you who haven't yet had the chance to share your experiences of accessing health and support information online with us. And also another development since the annual seminar, we've also added a healthcare professional survey um, for anyone listening this morning who works with people with PCA, just to gather perspectives from, from all angles. 
So a bit of context for those of you in the audience who might be joining us for the first time or who perhaps aren't aware of this project. Um, I'm just going to explain a bit about why we're asking you to share your experiences of accessing health information online. So we've got some large research studies coming up where we're going to be developing specifically two new support programmes, one for people living with PCA and one for your family and friends. And the important thing to note about these programmes is that they are all going to be online. And there's reasons for this in that we can make it more widely accessible to people living all over the world or English speaking world to start off with who are experiencing PCA. But in doing that, we do get and we do understand that there are specific challenges that an experience of PCA can bring when accessing any information online. And so before we start designing them, we want to ask and hear directly from you about those particular challenges and also if there are any triumphs or any success stories. The idea is that the more we learn directly from you at this early phase, the, the more that we can incorporate into the design process and speak with software developers who can kind of tweak how we deliver these online programs. And so that when we actually come to show you them and ask you what you think of them, you can hopefully see that we've taken all of your considerations on board and that we've designed an online support program that's very much with you in mind and very mindful of the challenges that you as perhaps someone living with or around PCA can face. How you can help us specifically then? So as I mentioned, we've got three separate surveys called our digital access surveys. And we're inviting you to complete one of these depending specifically on your experience with PCA. So there's one survey for you um, in the audience members who are living with PCA. One for those of you in the audience who are family and friends of a person with PCA. And the third survey, as I mentioned before, is for healthcare professionals. And I'd particularly like just to thank members um, of RDS, um, some of you who might be listening, um, who took the time to review and guide how we presented this survey. So even before we go and develop the programmes, we wanted to make sure that obviously we're asking a survey online. And so we wanted to make sure that um, we had guidance from people living with PCA to make that as easy as possible to, for you to share your responses. So all three of these surveys will broadly ask questions about your internet use and preferences, and this is in the context of accessing health information and support online, and um, things like your thoughts and opinions about things that have and haven't worked in the past. So for example, how much or how little you like and use Zoom, some background questions about your general health and well-being, as well as your thoughts about online security and privacy, which is always really important when we're talking about information to do with health. And these three survey links will be available in the follow-up email, which will follow a few weeks after this webinar. So all that remains for me to say is a huge thank you to those of you in the audience who helped us design and format the survey, those of you who've already taken part, and as particular thanks in advance to those of you who are listening today who are now considering sharing responses. If you've got any questions, um, I've put the uh, email address at the bottom of the slide. Um, so just to read that out, um, please do contact us at research at rarededementiasupport.org. And I really look forward to reading your responses. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Emily, so much. Uh, really helpful and always important for people to know how they can contribute. So many people um, talk about how valuable they find it taking part in research feeling they've got an outlet an opportunity to contribute so that's uh, one of many ways and we'll talk of others um, including trials in just a few moments um, if I could uh, now invite everyone who's on the panel the question and answer panel to join me on script Nikki and myself on screen that would be great um, and we will start going through a few of the questions that have come in during the meeting. Um, this is a, a live panel, so please do feel free to keep contributing comments or questions, or if our answers to your questions uh, don't quite tick the box for you or leave you with uh, more questions, uh, please feel free to share those too, and we'll tackle as many in the next 25 minutes or so um, as we can and, and others after the fact. Um, so I think most of the people on the screen uh, you have uh, met uh, in video form, uh, this is, these are the live uh, versions. I promise these are not avatars. This is the, the real people. Um, but just wanted to warmly welcome uh, Professor Jonathan Schott to the screen, uh, a great friend of all things PCA and all things dementia. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, we might start with you, John. Um, one of the questions following Keir's presentation about 
of the scientific updates from AIC um, is uh, related to um, diagnosis um, and uh, the interest in participation in drug trials. So I'll just read the question out loud. So my loved one is one year on from a PCA diagnosis. He is otherwise a fit and well 59 year old and has expressed an interest um, in joining current drug trials, but we have no idea how to explore this. Um, so how do people with PCA um, potentially get involved in clinical trials? Well, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Uh, and to be joining you uh, today. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, I, we're grateful to everybody who takes part um, in, in, in research. Uh, clearly, um, there is an enormous amount that is done and is done by RDS and these groups and so many of the talks, inspiring talks that we've heard this morning about um, caring for and living well with uh, PCA and other forms of dementia. Um, but as Kira's outlined, there is also a huge amount going on in the research space to understand why people get uh, dementia in general. Uh, PCA is a specific uh, subtype and the different forms of dementia uh, that uh, underpin those different uh, disorders like PCA, such as Alzheimer's uh, disease. So there are many ways that people can get involved in clinical uh, research. And often we can give pointers to this via the RDS services. Um, there's a particular issue about drug trials um, in, 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 in PCA. Um, and drug trials, for the most part, are, are run by pharmaceutical companies. Um, and there's generally um, uh, an onus to uh, research, particularly the sort of the more common forms of, of dementia. Um, and particularly sort of typical Alzheimer's disease, which affects people a bit older and have memory type problems. Um, and something that Seb and I and others have been battling against for some time is that often the design of these studies, because they want to in include uh, people who have got a sort of more typical Alzheimer's disease, will often actually preclude people who have got atypical forms or unusual forms, visual, people with visual problems or, or speech problems. And this is something that, um, that that we've recognized and been pushing for for some time, and I think is now getting some, some traction. And in fact, the idea that people who have PCA, which is underpinned by Alzheimer's disease, actually may be ideal people to go into clinical trials um, because they're younger and they have few other medical problems and often have quite good often have good memories and understanding about what's going on um, uh, for them and therefore really should be involved in clinical trials. So at the moment, it's often quite difficult for people to enter drug studies, but this is something that we hope is changing very fast. And we've now got very good collaborators who are working on very big studies of atypical Alzheimer's disease in the United States, um, who, uh, who are also uh, pushing this message that, in fact, people with younger and, and unusual forms may be ideally placed to take part in clinical trials. So for the moment, I think the, uh, the answer to the question is just to try and get involved in research if you're able and willing. Um, and again, I think we can provide details here about the PCA sorts of research that's going on in the UK. Um, there are various forums such as um, Join Dementia Research, which is a, a public site that people can go on to and find out what research is going uh, going on, and also can perhaps join us um, in terms of the uh, of the co development of some of the research research and make it clear uh, help us raise the raise the issue that people with PCA are often precluded from taking part in clinical trials and make the case that this is this is not appropriate and there's much to be learned. Um, so I, th I think uh, that's probably uh, where we're at. Fantastic, John. Thank you. That's really helpful and comprehensive and balanced. Much appreciated. Um, the next question, um, which um, maybe, John, you could start with, but it would be good to pass on uh, to Helen and David, to see if they've experienced anything similar, um, and to uh, Karen and uh, Nikki in particular, in case they've supported other people with similar um, experiences, is one question that's coming is, why do bouts of inner shaking and anxiety attacks happen? It happens suddenly. So I think a question there about with perhaps uh, a, a component about 
um, un unexplained or uncertain sensory or physical manifestations of PCA, um, but also the very much the, the acknowledgement of the psychological component in terms of possible anxiety causing people to shiver or shake. Um, John, would you be happy to start with that one? Of course, yeah. Um, so one thing that we ne we've known for some time is that people who have PCA or are developing PCA, anxiety is often quite a common early symptom and something that often continues um, as people develop PCA. Um, and I think, you know, we discuss quite a lot why this might be. I think part of this is an awareness that people often have that something's not quite right, but they're not quite sure what it is. And I think in the early stages, it's often people are aware that something's not right, but can't necessarily say what it is. Uh, and that's, of course, is very, very unsettling. Um, we know that PCA, of course, affects, uh, is, is a brain disorder that affects how you perceive the world around you from a visual percep perception. Um, and of course, that's also very um, disturbing. And I think people who have had vertigo or people who have had visual type problems, you know that um, if the input or you don't understand entirely what's going on in the world around you, that, that can cause anxiety. And we also know from some of the work that Keir's done that this extends beyond just vision, but actually to other linked aspects, including perception of, of balance and space and so forth. So that can cause um, can cause anxiety as well. As for the very brief um, episodes, I think it's a little unclear what, what those are, are due to. Um, again, whether these are transient episodes of, of vertigo, which I think are not uncommon, um, which is extremely, un un you know, all of us, I've had vertigo as well, it's extremely anxiety um, inducing, maybe the cause of that. But sometimes I think we need to put our hands up and say we're not we're not ent entirely sure of, uh, of 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 what the symptoms are due to, and therefore it's thinking about how best to manage them when they occur. So again, that's probably where others on this call are, are better placed to to talk about than me. Thank you, John. It's really helpful, um, Helena and David. I wondered um, if we might come to you next, John. Alluded to the fact that particularly when things like PCA are starting, then one can feel off color off key and not quite sure why and even after a diagnosis there are perhaps some symptoms which are, one has been told are clearly part of the condition and you can say yeah that's my PCA but other things that happen too and you, you're left being not quite sure why you're having these experiences is that something that you could you guys can relate to? I mean I can relate to that because um, I think that when things were beginning to change, that I knew, knew some things were changing, I didn't know what they were. And I've definitely had spatial, problems with spatial things. And it was a very strange, um, uh, it was just very strange because it was like, you, you think you know what the world looks like. And, and then it was like, it was all shifting. And it was very disconcerting. Um, yeah, I think I think the um, you know with hindsight, looking back to way before Helena was initially diagnosed with a visual impairment, um, but even before that, you know, actually, anxiety was a big thing. I mean, you'd had a hysterectomy and, and things like that, which were obviously not not great things happen. Our children had left home. It was always we attributed a lot. The you know, there was lots of things that that weren't quite right, and with hindsight. You know some of this um but for me for me it, the the thing that was, was very obvious was the spatial stuff yeah because that was weird it wasn't like a bit funny or some or a bit strange it was just weird yes yeah and even now i'd say it's a sort of it's a common symptom that something can suddenly trigger helena to lose grip of the situation in front of her and, and it, you know especially if you're we're out in a busy place and um uh, and then suddenly everything overwhelms but well, it's like that it's yeah. like things shift so i i think i've got a handle on where something is or you know and then it kind of just shifts not not massively but enough to just sort of almost like it's not 
not physically make you wobble, but it is that kind of, oh, you know, that's not what it seemed like not very long ago, you know. Yeah, that's that's yeah. really helpful. And it's really helpful, Helena, that you clear that there are, uh, are so clear that there are some things which one can question whether they're normal and other things which are categorically not normal. Um, and also, I, I like your word shifts, because I think it underlines how how variable these things can be and how, you know, for one moment to the next, something might change or alter that's a bit disconcerting for you. Um, Karen and Nikki, does, does this ring bells either from your experience working with lots of people in the PCA peer groups or with supporting people individually? Thank you, Sev. Um, I was going to quickly just come in and say that I have the huge privilege of meeting lots of people just after they've been diagnosed and they sign up to be members. And one of the first things is they haven't met anybody with PCA. They haven't been able to talk about the symptoms that Helen has just spoken about today. So giving them the courage to come and join us at a, a peer support group so they can meet other people and talk about the symptoms they're experiencing. They say reduces their anxiety, actually. So um, a really lovely community and friendly group. And we don't just have the peer support groups for the people living with. We also have the peer support groups for the family caregiver as well. So um, it's a lovely community environment where people can come and get that support and actually meet other people living with the same condition. So, Nikki, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I suppose from my perspective with support and support and people that have had PCA for, for, you know, quite some time and they've learned to live with it and sort of got used to it and they still have this anxiety and they still have these sort of almost like panic attacks and sometimes it's when they're overworking their brains they're too busy doing things and I know one gentleman has often sort of sent me photographs which he's been really disturbed about images and it has been sort of when he he's tired he's doing too much and he he feels that he's got a grip on everything and then like as Elena says it just shifts and he's thrown into one and it's really disturbing for him and it's really anxious and we've we've spent a lot of time with him working on sort of you know, having that downtime, that rest time, doing a mindfulness activity and finding sort of that happy place that he can go to and ultimately sort of have that treat time where he is relaxed and sort of this will pass. This is just something that's happening. And, you know, he, he feels he does get back in control with it. But I think, yeah, you do see the anxiety very early on, but you do, you know, it's something that does creep up at different points and it's learning how to have some coping skills to manage that as well. Thanks, both. Those are really great points. Charlie, I think you wanted to come in here as well. Well, it, it just um, it just made me think on Helena and David's page as well. There's, there's two lovely drawings on there that um, Helena thankfully passed on to me. Um, and they, they sort of were trying to capture, I think, some of those sort of anxieties and stresses. So just talking about these coping strategies and other ways that you might be able to sort of think about these things, things like drawing or uh, gardening, as we've mentioned as well possibly good ways of sort of bringing, bringing some of those emotions um, into a settled place as well. Yeah, absolutely. And really powerful ways. I've been moved by Ellen's pictures as well and the kind of powerful communication value they have as well, forgetting those of us who don't live with PCA to have some, some little understanding of what, what some of those uncertainties might be like. They're really powerful. Um, on, on this theme, um, another question that's come in um, uh, relates to another visual experience, which again, we, it'd be good to get people's comments on. So someone uh, has asked or has said, my friend for whom I'm a caregiver um, describes trees coming into the car when driving along. Can you give me an understanding of what is happening and how I can help? Um, so I'm going to do the cheeky bit and say a little bit about what might be happening and then hand over the harder bit about how you can help to others. Um, but I suppose one, one of the things that we know from speaking to lots of people living with PCA is that the world, as many of us see it, where there are different objects in different places in quite a kind of stable an understandable way so for example one thing is on the left one thing is on the right or I can see two things and they're a certain distance apart from each other um, is very difficult for pe most people living with um, PCA to see in the same way and what lots of people with PCA describe is as if one is seeing 
and please do correct me if I'm wrong here, Helena, or putting words in your mouth, but almost as if seeing parts of the puzzle one at a time, but not necessarily being able to see all of the pieces of the puzzle and the whole picture in one coherent whole. And so I think experiences like this sense that the trees are coming into the car can happen when someone glances in one direction and sees trees and then perhaps chooses to look at the road or sometimes the eyes just jump without one intending them to um, and then sees the road and the natural skill of the brain is to stitch all of our different parts of vision together into a coherent whole so it can give a very very realistic and believable sense that you know the the tree and the road are in the same place for example um that's my very sort of basic and limited understanding of it but i don't know if uh, john or helen or david you might care to comment i, th I think that's right um it's around the computation that's going on in your brain to make sense of all of this visual information that's flooding in simultaneously. And I think also that there's something about being in motion as well, which means that it's changing quite rapidly. So the, I guess an analogy is that if you go back to the old cine films that we used to see, which were basically individual pictures which were then presented in a very rapid fire manner and then your brain is literally stitching together the gaps between those static images to make something that's moving and that's clearly more complicated task for your brain to doing than just to look at one static image in front of you mm -hmm. so not only do people with pca often have difficulties when things are still but if you add in an element of movement as well, when things are changing very rapidly, that's understandably likely to stress the brain system a little bit more. And we know also that some people with PCA have particular issues with perceiving movement. For example, crossing the road can be difficult judging the speed of things. And I think that's all part of that, the, the same issue. So in terms of what to do about that, um, I think, as usual, it's sort of some reassurance as well, because when we all perceive things that are stressful, just being told that actually the, the trees aren't crashing into the car, which is, is reassuring. Um, I think, again, reassurance that probably it's this is likely to be worse when you're in, in motion. If it's really bad and you can, then perhaps stopping for a bit to, when, when things will hopefully settle down um, a, a little bit as well. Um, I've patients that I've seen one of the one of the things that you often say is to close your eyes but I think often people who close their eyes with PCA whilst in motion can feel really quite uh, unwell as well in terms of vertigo type symptoms as well so maybe that's not something to recommend you can give it a go but it wouldn't be surprised and make things worse so I think it's probably a reassurance and if it's really distressing then just trying to stop to get allow people to have their bearings but again I'll defer to David and Helena and people who are actually living with this more I mean I from my point of view definitely that sort of um um I don't know perception of um being able to put things together sometimes um and so I can um you know make a picture of something and I you know it and it makes sense and then sometimes it will kind of fall apart and the other thing that there is is that there's a speed thing around it not just about cars but like um anything that I'm trying to make sense of which is visual if it's happening too quickly then I then I won't be able to do it and whereas if I have got the you know if I'm relaxed and if you know there's um you know no rush at all then I will, it will fall into place a lot better and I, I mean I can see I mean we we do the park run um I guide Helena on the park run um it's quite difficult at the start when everything's very busy and what is very obvious is that um somebody moving across when when, when Helena's running somebody moving across her path maybe 15 or 20 feet away can trigger a response that that, that uh, anybody else would have somebody really sort of cutting in front of them it's like that the the the, the movement um has 
has triggered a, uh, the, 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 you know, the brain is responding to something's coming in from the left, but it's unable to put the depth into that. And it reacts, you know, Helen reacts as if someone is right in front of her and she stops. It's sort of like, you know, I can't even bump into somebody. No, you're not, they're 20 feet away. It's that kind of thing. And another story before, um, before the PCA diagnosis, when Helena had lost her driving license because of visual impairment and um, found that she really couldn't ride a bike anymore. It was locked down and I, I, I found a, a tandem um, being advertised on a, a local paper or, or somewhere. So I bought this tandem thinking, well, we can ride a bike. I can, you know, we want a tandem together. And um, uh, it didn't really work because the, there's a certain amount of, of collaboration in the balancing that you need between the, uh, the, the, the two people on a tandem. And Helena, I uh, realised that if I went past something, you know, a parked car or, or if we were riding on the seafront where we live, um, just past a lamppost or a, um, uh, you know, a building, um, she would she would she would react as if it, we were going to hit it you know it was sort of um there was something instinctive for, for her that was seeing this thing rushing towards her mm. that her brain could not um process into a I meaningful think, yeah so some of it is going on. it's not being able to process it fast enough i think yeah. yeah yeah and 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 that clearly um yeah, that, that mis, misunderstanding of what was really happening is definitely exacerbated by, by speed. Yeah, you know, that's, that's the, you know, if you're moving more quickly, then the time for making sense of, of you know, the, the visual uh, environment yeah. is, um, is obviously less. And yeah. then you can just trigger these, um, these sort of reactions that where, where, you know, Helena is, thinking that something um, quite dangerous is, is happening and so triggers all those kind of responses. Um, and the examples you both give there are really helpful because they also um, point to the fact that PCA affects a part of the brain, as we know, which is responsible for vision, but that our visual system is not just one thing. It's specialised mm -hmm. into different streams and in, in evolutionary terms, absolutely some, some of the visual system is geared up for, you know, looking at small things in great detail, but other parts of the visual system are geared up exactly for, as you say, for sort of threat detection, you know, something appearing, a predator perhaps appearing from the left or, you know, a branch swinging into view that you need to duck in order to avoid. Um, and so there are different parts of our, our visual system being affected in different ways by PCA, which can lead to some of these experiences. Um, one of the things I was just going to say in terms of the part of the question about what can do to help, um, and maybe to turn to you, Charlie, to see if you've had similar kind of work with people who are having similar ways of grappling with some of these visual challenges and adapting to them in order to keep creating. One of the things I found so helpful about the, the film that you mentioned, Simon Bull's animation, um, do I see what you see? Uh, what do you see what I see? Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it just makes people realize that they're not alone in these sorts of experiences. And it's not a, a foolishness or a misunderstanding or anything else. Other people are having very, very similar experiences, particularly when you're in that sort of environment you described, like during a run where there's lots of moving images, or as John mentioned, in a car moving at speed can provoke lots of these sorts of experiences and knowing that other people are going through similar things at a similar time I think can be quite helpful to reassure one and to help others understand that this is not just you being silly this is a genuine real experience this is how you're actually perceiving the world Charlie any any comments you wanted to add there um yeah I mean it it, it, it sounds like a really troubling thing to be experiencing as well and I, I suppose sometimes people try out a few different things like like within the home as well and I, I was just wondering about like tinted windows um or sitting in a different part of the car but i not to make light of it at all i suppose and caution is you might get a bit into tinting your windows and uh, <laughs> be in the supermarket car park with your spoilers and everything but i yeah i i was I, just thinking back charlie to one of one of the artists um with pca that I think you work with had a, a, a friend who they had adapted his sort of painting technique so that rather than having to paint as if he was sort of had an idea of the whole picture, they would do things like rotating the paper um, so that he could 
do the elements of painting that he enjoyed, the applying the paint and forming texture and colour and things, but not have to sort of, but changing the, the objective <laughs> to sort of have a piece of art that didn't require understanding or seeing the whole at one time. That sounds like things mm, you do with your say, yeah. art group. Yeah. yeah, so the art group that I go to, um, at, but also, uh, I mean, because they, they turn things around for me, you know, because I'll be doing something sometimes and I'll get a bit sort of stuck in what I'm doing, and I'm, you know, and then they'll turn it around and I go, oh, that looks different, <laughs> you know, and you just see it really differently because they've turned it around, um, which is really good. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is that um, I do know now that I use my sense of touch a lot more than I ever used to. That's really important. Yeah. Thank you. Really valuable. Thank you so much. I'm just conscious of time. I was just going to take one more question, if you don't mind me um, busting mm -hmm. the pips, as the BBC say. Um, and before I show you the video from the National Brain Appeal, um, one question, John, that came in um, from someone was, uh, is there any research related to PCA and fragile X ataxia tremor syndrome, which is often misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's? PCA has been diagnosed and we're waiting for the results of genetic testing. So I guess there's a very specific question there that we might take offline, but also a, a more general question about essentially can PCA co-occur with other conditions or particularly other neurological conditions? Um. <clears throat> Yes, so um, so uh, fragile X is a condition that, in in a major form, leads to sort of um, uh, some de developmental delay and, and some ongoing cognitive problems. But we now know that in a minor form, uh, can lead to some tremor related symptoms that emerge sort of later in life. I'm not aware of any particular link between um, fragile X and PCA per se. Um, in terms of um, co-pathologies, um, absolutely. Um, whilst neurologists like to define one diagnosis, clearly, all of us as people have more than one thing going on, and it's entirely possible to have um, more than one uh, condition. Um, going on simultaneously. So when we were talking about balance and visual problems, um, people with PCA may well have migraine as well. And uh, that's a classic example that perhaps if you have a migraine attack that gives you a headache and visual disturbance and balance problems, it may well be worse when you've got PCA. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they've got a linked uh, etiology, a linked cause, but they just need meet two different disorders that that can overlap and worsen, uh, worsen uh, symptoms. Um, in terms of the underlying cause of PCA, uh, um, as I'm sure most people on this call will know, for the most part, at least 80% of the time, we think this is due to Alzheimer's disease, but there are rarer conditions. Um, and in terms of, of genetics, there's been quite a lot of work done on, on genetics with perhaps some extremely unusual um, isolated cases. We don't think that this is a disorder that runs in families, but like most illnesses, um, well, all illnesses, they all occur really on a basis of environmental factors and, and some genetic risk factors and uh, teasing those out in particularly rarer conditions is extremely complicated. Um, but that's work that's sort of going on around the world at the moment. So to come back, I, I don't think that Fragile X is a cause of PCA. It doesn't mean that the two can't uh, coexist. Brilliant. Thank you for such a clear answer as always, John, and thank you to you and all of the other panellists uh, for being here to answer questions today. Um, and of course, if anyone has any questions they've not uh, had the opportunity to ask, do feel free to continue to send those through um, in the usual way to contact Red Image Sports, and we will do our best to deal uh, with them and get back to you. Um, Nikki, before I close out and uh, hand up back to Sam for the National Brain Appeal video, anything you'd like to comment or um, uh, or mention. 
just delighted that everybody could join us today. Thank you for your time in the summer holidays, although it's not very summery and sunny here. <laughs> it looks like it's November, actually. So quite disorientating time for all of us. Um, but no, absolute pleasure. And like Seb said, if you do got any questions or you require any support, please get in contact with us. And please come and join some of our support groups because you'll meet wonderful people like David and Helena. And that really makes a difference to you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you to everyone for your uh, all your contributions. Um, we'll close out by saying um, we've got a short video from the National Brain Appeal. Just in case you're about to switch off, this is a new video. Um, we've had one that we've played at a few meetings that you may have uh, seen before. This is a, a, a very contemporary update on where things are, particularly with the Rare Dementia Support Centre fundraising um, and, and other exciting uh, developments and recent activities. Um, so if you can spare um, a couple more minutes, there is just two or three minutes. Um, um, as we um, turn off our cameras, um, then you'll get an update from Eva Tate and her colleagues from the Wonderful National Brain Appeal. Um, so huge thanks again to all of you for being here, and we look forward to seeing you um, in person um, and online again soon. Best wishes for now. Hello, my name is Eva Tate, and I'm the Major Appeals Manager for the National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal is the charity that raises much needed funds for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and the um, UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology, altogether known as Queen Square in London. It is our aim as a charity to improve the lives um, of people living with neurological conditions across the UK. And at the moment that is amounting to around one in six of us, including rare dementias. We have been funding rare dementia support since the beginning and certainly since it was formalised in 2016. Um, over the past few years, we've been aiming to raise up to 350,000 a year to be able to um, improve and accelerate the services available to people. And um, in line with that expansion, um, and you'll know that there's now more than 5,000 members of RDS across the UK and some worldwide. We have committed as a charity to raise up to £7 million to create the world's first rare dementia support centre. This will be a permanent home for RDS and will be created around three key pillars, which are support, education and research for professionals, healthcare professionals, and also research into um, what type of support is um, most helpful to people living with um, these conditions, their families and friends. We um, have found a site for the centre and are well on our way to um, creating this fundraising goal. Um, we've raised well over a million pounds and have had some very high profile support over the past couple of years. Most notably in the last uh, six months, um, Richard Walker, the group chairman of Iceland Foods has climbed Everest for us, a truly remarkable feat. And 30,000 colleagues at Iceland Foods have been raising money for the Rare Dementia Support Centre over June during their fundraising weeks. So thank you very much to them. Um, but we've also had lots and lots of supporters who have done incredible um, races, runs, walks. Um, we've had people travel across the Mongolian steppe raising funds for us, um, across the Pyrenees, and also um, people doing um, bake sales, and all sorts of community events as well. We'd like to thank each and every one of you, all the people who have taken part in fundraising and who continue to take part in fundraising. There is some match funding available uh, for anybody who would like to raise funds for the centre. And I would encourage you to get in touch with a member of our, my team, with myself or any member of the, um, the National Brain Appeal team um, who can help to support you and encourage you in any of your efforts. Um, we also had a garden at Chelsea Flower Show this year where the designer Charlie Hawkes worked with members of RDS and um, particularly those living with posterior cortical atrophy to create an incredibly beautiful garden that went on to win three medals, uh, one of which was a gold at Chelsea. So we're absolutely delighted by the awareness raising that this brought about um, and all the coverage on um, BBC. The garden has now moved to Exbury Gardens in Hampshire and it's free to visit um, by anybody who is a member of RDS and their carer. 
Um, we hope that it being in Hampshire will allow more people to be able to visit than um, were able to visit Chelsea. And ultimately, we hope that that garden will be able to move to the Red Dementia Support Centre when it's ready to be able to accept it. Um, thank you again. And I encourage you, please, just to contact us if um, and to follow us also on social media that um, you'll, you'll hear a lot more news about what, what's happening at RDS um, in terms of fundraising. And you'll also be able to keep up to date with any of our activities that we are planning over the next couple of years. Um, thank you again. And we really are looking forward to making sure that this um, centre is a real home from home for those living with um, these conditions, their families and friends. Thank you again. My name is Stephanie Still, and I'm the Senior Fundraising Officer at the National Brain Appeal. I'd like to start off by saying thank you to anyone who's fundraised for us in the past. You are fantastic and your efforts are really valued. I have a wonderful job at the National Brain Appeal because I get to look after all of the fundraisers who want to take on an activity to support us. Over the years, we've seen people take on incredible challenges like marathons, taken on triathlons, We've even had a few who braved a skydive. We've also had wonderful fundraisers who've brought together friends, family and colleagues to host a coffee morning or to arrange a golf day or carol concert, you name it, to support RDS. Our fundraisers enable RDS to keep running and mean we can continue to support people like you. So if you're interested in becoming a fundraiser or you'd like to fundraise again, I will be here every step of the way to support you. If you might be interested in taking on an active challenge like a run, swim or walk, there are a range of suggestions on our website of upcoming events that you could take part in. Or if you're like me and aren't really into sporting activities, then there's still a range of things that you can do to support us from bake sales to coffee mornings and I'll be here to make suggestions and to help you think up ideas. I really hope to hear from some of you and we'll be here to help you make a successful, fun fundraiser. Thank you.